I want to invite us to a short se uh, session, which I believe uh, is uh, quite important, uh, however, and I pray that it is going to add to the repertoire, to the reserve of our ministry tools as uh, young people, because this is a time when the Lord is calling upon the young and the best, uh, the brightest uh, that the world can offer so that they can move forward the gospel ministry to it is uh, completion in these closing hours of uh, the world's uh, history. So I want to uh, pray that uh, the sharing we are going to have on uh, session on uh, this uh, session, the speech is going to place us so that we can be better positioned, better prepared to serve our Almighty uh, without any fear uh, in the vineyard. Now, um, the theme for our camp meeting is a befitting one that you have uh, chosen. And uh, once again, um, I haven't had the ability to share uh, if uh, the host can relinquish the sharing to me. Seems like we can't share two of us uh, so that we can be able to move forward. <clears throat> we are a very visual generation. As a matter of fact, now the new term for our generation is the, the screen ages. You move from your phone to your iPad, to your tablet, to the TV. And so uh, we have to struggle as uh, ministers <laughs> to talk to congregations who are so used throughout the week to watch on their screens. And yet we just want to use the audio. So I hope that the visual will uh, be a good day to us so that we can all be blessed um, in a greater way. I just finished a, a session with uh, uh, the youths in my district. I serve Dandora district at uh, the moment. What that tells you, uh, uh, my dear Pastor Kigundu, is that ideally you should have made a service call uh, through the union so that I can speak <laughs> on the Zoom meeting tonight. Uh, but we thank God uh, because uh, of uh, the privilege to share together in uh, a friendly way. Speech and um, your theme drawn from the book of uh, Second, uh, rather First Timothy chapter four, verse twelve, most befitting, a text that Paul writes to a pastor whom he hopes to take over the baton of ministry. He has to run with it because the experience, the senior pastor Paul is exiting the stage and so young Timothy has got to carry on with the ministry. And how is it going to be? What happens when you have a great church a church with many members who are more experienced, who are older, who are wealthier, who are more powerful, uh, and then you step in just as a young pastor. It is a daunting task even to fill in the shoes of the departing pastor. This is the situation that uh, Timothy finds himself in. And so Paul writes to him, in his fear, in his uh, anxiety, in his uh, hesitation, is wondering how is it going to be? How can I take over from this great man, Paul, and uh, the great work that he has done? I don't want to make any mistake. I want to carry on the greatness, the legacy of uh, this man of God. So he's afraid, he's uh, somewhat uh, timid, if you would. And so Paul writes to him and tells him that it is not about your age. It is not about your experience. These things are important, but sometimes they are overrated. And so he tells him that what gives us the power and the authority to minister in the vineyard, it is not the age that we have or even the experience sometimes rather it is the ability that is the empowering of the holy spirit the unction that comes from him when we are available then it makes us able it is about availability and not even about ability and so Paul admonishes him, encourages him, exhorts him that all you need to do in your youngness is to position yourself in a state where nobody will look down on you because of your youth. And how do you do this? How do you achieve credibility? Simple. He gives him a formula. Just be an example. Just be a model. Aspire to walk the talk. And so he tells him quite a number of things there that he needs to watch out for. He tells him that number one, you be an example to the believers in speech. Your speech alone will give you the credibility. 
it will raise your stature and give you the humble time, the position, the space that you need to carry forward the gospel ministry. It tells him, number two, your conduct that will dig deeper into tomorrow. Then your love, your faith, and your purity, all these aspects will enable you to offer a ministry which will be acceptable, which will be uplifting, which will be inspiring, and which shall lead people, God's people, and to salvation. And so tonight, my friends, I want to invite you as we dig a little bit deeper and consider the wonderful privilege of speech that God has given us. It is for the sake of ministry. It is not for our own glory. It is not so that guys can be like, wow, that guy is great. Whatever skills that the Lord will enable you that is going to um, uh, you know, um, endow you with, they are only a blessing as they bring many into the gospel ministry. Amen? We are living at a time where it is like everybody has been given a mic, if you so wish. We all have got that mic, and we have the stage. As Paul said that it is like we are open letters being read by all men. That couldn't be more real than our lives today, where everybody is uh, screaming about freedom of speech, uh, freedom of expression, and so we have it. The social media and the conventional media, they are inundated, they are saturated with content of every man. Speeches, many of them, uh, which you even pause and wonder, uh, I mean, uh, who wrote this, uh, who said this, uh, were they in their right minds, all in the name of freedom of speech, freedom of expression. So yes, it is true. And maybe you haven't been given, you know, a CNN, uh, you know, uh, uh, time. Uh, you haven't had your uh, minute of glory, perhaps to to shine uh, on some uh, uh, popular uh, media platform. But the truth is that just by the mere fact of the time we find ourselves in, all of us got a mic to ourselves. So how are you using this mic? The mic can be a blessing, the mic can be a curse. And it is unfortunate that when we use our words, it is hard to take them back. They can only be forgiven. And so because of that, it behoves us, it calls upon each one of us to be more conscious, to be more intentional, very deliberate in the way you use your words today. Because for sure, you cannot undo, you're not able to undo what words that you give out. So it tells Timothy that it does not matter. I know that you are young and inexperienced, it is true. I do know that, yes, the fashion church that I have been leading is a church which is big, number one. It is a church that has got older, experienced, wealthier congregants. Yes, I know that as the outgoing pastor, I am much older, more experienced, more learned, even articulate, perhaps, than you could be. But, you see, that is not the issue. This is not the point. You miss the point, Timothy. You don't have to be timid. You don't have to uh, be afraid. The feelings of inadequacy that you have, the solution to this is by watching out on your speech. What kind of words do you give? Are they words that, you know, are a server uh, life unto life, or they are words that bring death? James expressed this in a powerful way, and rightfully so, when he writes in the book of James, chapter 3, verse 8, he says that no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil. It is full of deadly poison. That is how uh, the NLT uh, expresses it. So our words, they can be a blessing, but they can also totally destroy. The power in a word sometimes cannot even be well measured. The impact that simple words have 
is so powerful. What can build up, what can bring down, what can kill, what can give life. Many of us indeed are broken the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, just by our mere words. The words we speak, which discourage, they deaden the inside, which is even worse than physical death itself. So James puts it and says that because of the human tongue, the words that we, we bring forth, our speech, they can be poisonous, they can be deadly. Words are as powerful as fire. Our speech can start a fire to burn up or to fire the rub. My beloved young friends, the challenge is this. When we open our mouths, our speech that comes forth, is it burning up things or it is firing up people? Is it helping things up? Is it inspiring? Is it building? That is the meaning of firing up. Is it motivating? Is it uplifting? Is it edifying? Those are the thoughts that we have, we must have in mind as we open our mouths to say anything. That we either are either burning down or we are firing people up. We are inspiring people, a generation, a congregation, a community, a church, a school, a university community to greatness and to goodness. When we shout and say, comrade, power, you need to be careful the next words that will come out because they're either going to burn up or they're going to fire the rap. And so what Paul says is this, if we gain self-mastery by the grace of God and cultivate proper habits of conversation and sharing, our words will fire up the world with God's light and bring revivals across the lands. Amen. Our words have the ability to bring revivals, to light up our world, because they are going to be what? It will be a speech of encouragement. It will be a speech to inspire. One of my favorite school mottos is the school motto of uh, Mango High School. It says, Jishinde Ushinde. Jishinde Ushinde. You see, if we are able to gain self-mastery over these aspects of speech, of conversation, then in a great way, we'd have won. Many people are in trouble today because of their words, because of their speech. If we can have a hold of ourselves, if we can gain victory of ourselves, then indeed, we would have won truly. Alexander the Great, a man that many uh, lovers of history know, and of course, uh, the prophecy students here, he was able to conquer the known world then, at a young age, much older than he, is, than he was when he conquered the whole world. But he didn't conquer himself. He could not conquer himself. And the pen of inspiration writes this of him, the book Child Guidance, page 95, paragraph 3. It says that the man or woman who preserves the balance of the mind when tempted to indulge passion, stands higher in the sight of God and heavenly angels than the most renowned general that ever led an army to battle and to victory. Say the celebrated emperor when on his dying bed, among all my conquests, there is but one which affords me any consolation now, and that is the conquest I have gained over my own turbulent timber. Alexander and Caesar found it easier to subdue a world than to subdue themselves. After conquering nation after nation, they fell one of them the victim of intemperance, the other of mad ambition. Conquering self, gaining victory, gaining mastery of ourselves is critical to a victory, to a real victory as servants in the master's vineyard. If we have to partner with him, one critical area is to have mastery in the area of speech. Speech that will set us on a way to victory, on a way to better ministry, that will help us to be more effective servants in God's vineyard. And so friends, I want to share just briefly a few things, a few things that can help us as we think, as we reflect on our speech, uh, that we can uh, you know, be cognizant of, that we should be conscious of, that we should take into consideration so that the Lord can partner with us in a more effective way as we serve him in his vineyard. And the very first 
This comes from uh, the book Gospel Workers, page 30. Uh, the penal inspiration says that to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, the tidings of pardon through Christ are to be carried. Not with tame, lifeless utterances is the message to be given, but with clear, decided, stirring utterances. The power of speech, especially in a world today, in bringing the convicting word of God through the Holy Spirit to the world, it needs to be carried through speech in power, in a clear way, in a decided way, so that God's people can get the everlasting message in this last generation. A principle we need to carry here, speaking with conviction, with clarity, not with fear. Sometimes our mission efforts, they avail not as much as they could because our speech comes not in a convincing way. There is a lot of fear there. There is a lot of timidness there. There is a hesitation there. And people even start doubting our ability or even what we carry. The, in the elements of speech, the, the aspect of ethos, you know, uh, speaking with um, a, a conviction, it brings credibility even to the message. And God is able to give this to us because this is a gift that he can develop. Also, as we speak, we need to be careful. What are we speaking about? What is our message? What do we hope to pass across? There's a lot that can be said. There's a lot in the social media and in the media space that can be said. But we have something higher. We have a message to tell the world. There is a living power in truth. And the Holy Spirit is the agent that opens human minds to the truth. But the ministers and workers who proclaim the truth must show certainty and decision. They are to go forth in faith and present the word as though they believed it. Try to make those for whom you labor understand that it is God's truth. Preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. This will confront Satan's lies. It is important we be clear about the content that we carry through our speech. You may be gifted, but a lot of the time, we waste our time, my dear friends, on social media. Uh, you know, talking about teams, you know, Manu, Arsenal, as some of us are social media accounts and statuses, they do not portray a speech that will bring the glory and honor to God that Paul envisioned that will bring credibility to the ministry of Timothy. Jesus Christ is our message. Preach Jesus. Every opportunity to share with a friend, even in casual, lowly speeches, lift them up give them, bring them a notch higher by gradually introducing the ultimate need of everybody. And that message should be Christ-centered. It should not be a message to bring controversy around. This is what the inspired messenger says. The book Evangelism, uh, the, evang uh, the Cole Potter Evangelist, page 60 and 61. She writes and says that we need far less controversy and far more presentation of Christ. Our Redeemer is the center of all our faith and hope. Those who can present his matchless love and inspire hearts to give him their best and holiest affections and in work that is great and holy. Beloved brothers and sisters, listen to this. A lot of the time, the controversy we mire ourselves in, especially trying to take political positions or popular fashion positions, uh, some of these current affairs that we engage ourselves in, sometimes they push away, they rebel potential interests who we will have developed for the kingdom. Avoid controversy. Preach Christ. Focus people's minds whenever you find the opportunity to speak. You want a content? Preach Christ. Avoid controversy. It doesn't help so that Christ, when he is uplifted, as the Bible says in John 12, verse 32, then it will draw all men to himself. The messenger goes on to say that the many argumentative sermons preached, they seldom soften and subdue the soul. The sermons that we preach, which are full of controversy, which are hammering people down, they don't help them. People may listen and even almost think this is the truth. But as somebody has said, people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. Let us preach Christ and is a Christ of love. 
We need to present our messages with urgency and authority. The personal worker is more than a peddler of doctrinal facts. He handles the precious gems of truth. His casual doorstep chats, his fireside Bible studies are not just aimed to get people into the truth. Each is freighted with the worker's heart burden to save lost men and women out of this untoward generation. Beloved friends, we have just but a short time to present this message. The power of the word in our hand, we shall not have it forever. Propation will soon close. Let us use every opportunity we have to pass across a message which is true, a message of everlasting hope to a dying world. Amen. And as I come to a, clo a close, I want to say that we need to understand that as we deal with people, people have got burdens in their hearts of every nature. Because of that, other people position themselves in a certain state. They may be uncourteous, they may be mean, they may be rude, but we need to deal with them with kindness. We need to be patient with them. We deal with people of every kind and mind, how necessary, therefore, that the personal worker be kind, patient, understanding, and well poised. So you what? should not be a reaction to those that we speak to. We should be proactive to bring forth life, to bring healing, to speak blessing, to speak restoration in many people who are bitter perhaps because of the failures in their lives, because of lost opportunities, because of broken dreams and promises. And so we need to come to a level of uplifting them, not go down to a level of getting into where they are stuck. Let our words be winning, gentle catches uh, and of catches uh, demeanor. Those who work for Christ are to be upright and trustworthy, firm as a rock to principle, and at the same time, kind and catches. Courtesy is one of the graces of the Spirit. To deal with human minds is the greatest work ever given to man, and he who will find access to hearts must heed the injection, be pitiful, be catches. Those are the principles if you desire to be successful in your ministry. Our speech, let it be with a tinge, with a touch of courtesy, of love, of gentleness, especially in a rough world. Somebody has said, some anonymous person has said that, talk fast with your mind before you talk with your tongue. Have a conversation with your mind before you bring forth the words. Remember, you have to prepare your heart so that you can be able to deliver. Because the word of the Lord says that what comes out is what is inside. The outside is just but the index of what is within. Indeed, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, the word of the Lord says that guard your heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. So beloved brothers and sisters, once again, you have that mic. You see the mic there. You hold it. Whether you like it or not, we are holding a mic on a global stage, on a world stage. What, what's are coming forth? What kind of speech is the world seeing from us? Is it a speech that is going to lift up or that is going to kill? Do not let anyone look down on you because you're young, but be an example for the believers in your speech, in your conduct, your love, faith, and purity. I thank God for the gift of speech, and I pray that the Lord will use it in a powerful way to bring restoration, to bring healing upon the nations, upon our university community, upon our hostel rooms, our friends, our neighbors, so that people will live with everlasting hope. Take the mic. Ask God for the wisdom to speak in love and gentleness, because you know what? I believe sometimes God may not just be having the mouth right now, you are his mouth, to speak healing and peace and restoration and everlasting hope to some soul that is about to die. May the Lord bless us in Jesus' name. Let us pray together. Father everlasting, we thank you for the privilege of being your children. You have called us into sonship of Father Lord. We are your daughters in the kingdom. We are part of the commonwealth of Father Lord. And beyond that, you have also enjoined us to be partners with you in bringing in many who are hopeless to the wonderful light. Lord, you have given us the gift of speech.
through words that we can speak, words of everlasting hope, words of healing to many who are hopeless. Bring hope to them, O oh Father Lord. Show them the light from the darkness. And Lord, how I pray that tonight you will place us with your grace in the power of your spirit so that we will be able to speak these words with love and gentleness so that they shall hear as the pleading voice of the Savior, speaking in love to them, telling them, my son, my daughter, why die? Here is life, choose life. I pray, O oh Father, Lord, that even with the truths that you have given us, some of them which are pointed, we still will find the wisdom and the grace to speak uh, to our friends, to our neighbors, O oh Father, Lord, to our communities in a loving way that will reflect your love, that will heal and not kill, that will raise, O oh Father, Lord, and not destroy. King of glory, forgive us for the many paths we have been arrogant in our speech, where we haven't been humble, where we have been proud of Father Lord, where we have had, Lord, and now may you renew us so that our ministry will be better, it will be higher, it will be sweeter for the sake of those that we minister to. In a special way, I pray for a blessing of heaven upon all the comrades, the Kenyatta University, SV Church, the leadership through your man's servant, Pastor uh, Kigundu, or Father Lord, the eldership and everybody, so that they remain a shining light in that wonderful community, a place of Father Lord of great knowledge, yet great darkness. Let them be used as agents and channels so your light will shine abroad. Continue blessing us in this entire camp meeting, O Father Lord. This is your time. May you revive us and restore us unto yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. Bye.